a superb presentation this morning. So now I'm going to formally introduce him, Richard Nesco, a geneticist at the Dorina Genetic Resource Centre with the USDA Forest Service. Richard, I'm just going to pass the screen to you. If you can accept the invitation to present there. Now Richard has been working in resistance breeding for several decades and has developed resistance programs for several species faced with non-native pathogens. It's fantastic to have him here today to talk to us in the Myrtle Rust webinar series all the way from the US of A and it looks like he's well set up now to start his presentation. Feel free to get underway. Hello everybody. Um... Thank you for the invite to present here. I'm always uh, willing to share information. I'm always looking for feedback on our programs and how to make them better and everything. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about, uh, all right, hang on a minute. Today I'm going to talk about finding and developing genetic resistance to disease in forest trees. Same thing could invite apply to past insects, et cetera. And this is gonna be mostly from lessons from the Pacific Northwest United States and actual successful resistance programs uh, and how they might apply to rust, uh, myrtle rust. And so really almost every slide I show, you'll be able to think in some capacity, how, how would that apply to myrtle rust? Could that apply to myrtle rust? And I think in many cases uh, that the answer is yes. So again, as, as Renee mentioned, I'm with the USDA Forest Service, and my email uh, is on the screen there that you can contact me. Um, we all know that worldwide, there's been an array of non-native invasive pathogens or pests that are affecting our forest tree species. And in some cases, they uh, have a, a extremely high kill, kill rate, uh, kill rate of uh, you know 90% or more. And, uh, you know, murder rust is just one of them. Uh, in, the, in the U.S., there are several groups that work with developing disease resistance, but one of the big groups is the USDA Forest Service, and that's uh, where I'm involved. Okay, so what are the threats? Non-native insect and disease problems are, are a big part of it. You can also ask some native ones as well too. But they, they've increased public awareness that some tree species can become extinct or very rare in a short period of time. They can lead to major changes in forest ecosystems and urban forests. They can lead to serious economic losses and managed forest plantings. And then they can be further complicated by climate change. Um, and if, if one were to look at the non-market value of trees from a carbon storage and air pollution removal, you know, that value oftentimes far exceeds even their economic value, their pure economic value. So it's something worth keeping in mind when you think about, hey, do we need and can we afford a resistance program? Um, this is a publication I saw just a week or two on one of the uh, uh, table of contents alert. And the only thing I want you to see is the bottom, the last line of the abstract. And in the last line of the abstract, um, hope lies in enormous genetic uh, power within plants to establish selection and breeding programs that will ultimately enable us to plant trees that can cope in climbing, climate change and or with pests and pathogens, whether they are native or invasive. So a lot more people are starting to recognize the power of breeding for trees. It's kind of come on lately, but with the success stories that we and a few others have had, uh, a lot of people are recognizing it as a very powerful tool. Okay, so resistance breeding is solution oriented, okay? Uh, we're not talking about publications, we're not talking about, you know, basic research even and whatever too, and I'll show you know, a little bit of information on that too. But it's one, in many cases, it's probably the only solution that's really going to work. So I, I think very on, you have to ask that question, do we have a serious problem or are we interested in solutions? It also happens to be kind of a green solution. You know, generally it's organic, it's, if done properly, it can be sustainable, and generally it has little or no side effects all good things. Now, if you decide to go into a resistance program, you might develop a diagram like this or use this one. This is the key. 
know, there's at least four major components to developing resistance and using the resistance. There's a research phase, can be very, very important. Um, but by itself, it's meaningless, okay? Uh, some publications come out of it, but there's there's a lot of publications out there where the information is never used, okay? So the worst thing you could do is let things get caught up in research and stay in research, okay? There's a tree breeding or tree improvement phase, and that's the key phase really for this if you're really gonna want the solution. They're, remember, they're all important, but, but without that phase, uh, you know, you, you, you will not get to the end point. There's also management commitment over time and public support. That is key because, you know, you're not going to do these programs one, two or three years or something. And then what we've realized recently and pulled people together, there's a reforestation or restoration part of it. And that's where the land managers or civil culturalists, they're the ones that are responsible and get the material back out there once we have resistance and develop. So really, this is a big team effort, and again, I'm, not, I'm going to emphasize that research is important, but the, I would not let research lead the effort if, if you're looking to develop resistant trees. You really need something like a tree improvement program or tree breeding program and informed partnerships. This is my, the facility I work at, and a couple of things you'll notice is it's got a pretty good land base, and we do things on a, we think, in a large scale. Because re developing res resistant populations, remember, we're not horticulture or crops. We're not looking to develop one genotype in the cultivar and put it out there. We want to maintain genetic diversity. We want to maintain adaptability. And to do that, you have to work on populations of trees with resistance, okay, and genetic durability. So we do things on a big scale. We probably have the world's largest hog chamber, at least for plants. You know, and it works very, very well. So, you know, if you're going to go in, at some point you go in, you do it correctly, put together a, a great team, put together the proper facilities, and then think of a lot of screening. This slide shows resistance programs underway, or at least some of them in Western North America and Hawaii. And I'm involved in, to a certain extent, in, in all of these. The, the first uh, eight or nine are all with various species of five needle pines or white pines. And then you have one of our cedar species that gets a Phytophthora root disease. Over in Hawaii, the two major species over there, Koa and Ohia, have serious problems of sorts. And then we have some other things with true furs. And then just yesterday, we got a report that the emerald ash borer has uh, been found in Oregon. It had not been in Oregon before. It had only been as far as Colorado. Uh, so now we've got some serious thinking uh, to do. Fortunately, we started being proactive a couple of years ago and started some things with Oregon ash. Uh, but now uh, it's time to step up the game or stand by and watch the species disappear. So there's really two major phases in developing resistance. In the first phase, you ask the question, is there a genetic resistance? And you also want to make sure people know that resistance is not immunity. That's not the way it's going to work in most tree species. You're not going to have immunity. You know, for white pine blistera, the five needle pines are all susceptible, okay? Douglas fir is not susceptible, okay? Uh, so, you know, uh, once the species is susceptible, you probably aren't going to get to immunity, at least in, uh, without some um, uh, special technologies. After you determine whether there is genetic resistance, what's the frequency and what's the geographic distribution of resistance? Generally, resistance, especially to non-natives, uh, uh, biotic agents are going to be generally low, and the geographic distribution of the resistance may vary. We've seen that in our trials. And then you want to ask what type of resistance. Is it complete or partial? Is it controlled by one major gene, or is it quantitative resistance? You also want to know what level of resistance, you know, let's talk about survival. You know, great, we have resistance and in all of our species that varies and some of them can have, you know, 50, 60, maybe 70% survival out in the wild. Others right now without breeding will have 10% survival. So, so questions to ask, you know, is it at a usable level? If you tell a national park that you have something that has 50% of the seedlings will survive, they say that's great because right now, you know, 2% of the seedlings survive. So they may be willing to plant two seedlings to get one survival. With forest trees, 
you have to ask, is it durable? Trees are out there for decades or hundreds of years. They've got to be the progenitors of future generations. So really, the, the, the resistance has to be able to last forever. And there's certain ways of going about it and looking at it to do the best job possible to see if that can be done. Um, again, I would not use most crop models uh, as, as the way to go. Um, is it stable resistance? Sometimes uh, a couple degrees temperature change, which will happen under climate change, can influence the stability of resistance. So we want to know, will the resistance be durable? Will it be stable? After you've determined that information in phase one, then you can get into, well, great, now we want to develop resistant populations. Let's go all in. Uh, do we need to breed? Do we need seed orchards? Uh, or if we're going out to the resistant trees in the field and collecting seed to use, how do we protect them from fire, from other insects, et cetera? Uh, what is the expected level of survival? How many trees do the seedlings does the land manager have to plant to get the targeted number that they want eventually? Who or what group oversees resistant seed development? How do you organize a successful program? Uh, you know, part of it's focusing on developing resistant populations, not research. One of my colleagues over in Hawaii, where I do some work, uh, he says, uh, I told him something a number of years ago, I forgot about it. I said, hey, with several of our programs, we have solved the problem. We have resistant populations. However, I can't tell you all the underlying mechanisms. I can't tell you the number of genes involved. Okay, if you wait to answer all those questions, you're not going to have a program that's putting stuff out in the field. We now have material that people can look at that and answer those questions, but sometimes people start prematurely looking at those questions before they even have the bona fide resistant material to look at them. So, you know, really tree breeding is an old art that's been out there for thousands of years, very effective in many traits. And it's really the starting point for developing resistance. You know, I would not launch into genomics until you have some bona fide resistant material. Um, so the focus is developing resistant populations and also on large scale screening. You know, and of course we want to know when will resistance seed be available. That's going to vary by species and program. How do we maximize restoration even if we have resistant seed? That's something that land managers and civil cultures are asking have to think about. And then, you know, high tech, how can genomics or biotechnology aid the conventional resistance program? By themselves, those are meaningless, okay? If they're not part of a conventional resistance tree improvement program. One of the groups of species I work with are white pines or five needle pines and white pines listerus. There's nine native five needle pines in the US, okay? They're all susceptible. To a certain extent, I work with all nine of them. They all tell a different story in terms of the type of resistance they have, the level of resistance they have. And, and, and a, fortunately, we can use the same type of inoculation system on all of them, but there are some nuances. So you do have to be careful. Basically, it breaks down to there's two general categories of resistance. There's major gene resistance, really sexy, uh, kind of a thing that a lot of crop species uh, use. We, we have some, some parent trees that will throw out seedlings that are 100% resistant. However, it turns out for the most part to be temporary resistant. Uh, and a couple of our, our white pine species, after 5, 10, 15, 20 years, there's certainly a virulent, there's a virulent strain of rust that's developed. And now we have some areas where we can't plant using that major gene resistance or else it will be worse literally than our susceptible control. Partial resistance or quantitative resistance is really what you want to go after if you do have that present in your, your species. You can use the major gene resistance in conjunction with it, but by itself, you have to be somewhat cautious on how you use major gene resistance. This is a list of the nine North American species and a few Eurasian species. And basically, I'm only showing this to show you a couple of things. One, there's different types of resistance, different levels of resistance. And if you see the first two species in the list, Pinus lambertiana, sugar pine, Pinus monticula, western white pine, we've tested seedling families or progeny of over 4,000 parent trees over the many decades. Okay, so again, a numbers game. The resistance is low. Both those species, we're going to have to do breeding, and we are doing breeding to increase the level and the combination of resistance. 
Pinus albicola, the thir third one on that list, we've only tested 1,500 of, of those parent trees as, as seedling families in our program. It was really originally expected that that was going to be more susceptible than the other two species, but we got lucky. And at least in Oregon and Washington, part of the range, we actually have some usable resistance in some parts of a range where you can just go out to the parent tree, collect from it, or set up a seed orchard with it, uh, produce the seed, and put it out there without breeding. And you might be able to get something on the order of 30, 40, 50, 60 percent survival on, on a site that is moderate to high hazard. So, we, sometimes you get lucky, okay? <clears throat> this is a graph of Western White Pine or Pinus monticula, and it shows two things. Percent of, of the 13 families tested, percent of uh, trees over time that get cankers, that's on the left, and the percent that die from the cankers, that's on the right. And I hope you can all see the green, red, and the black or blue colors. Essentially, the red is our susceptible control. And if you notice real quick, you'll notice that the three green lines on the left graph are as high or higher, actually, than our susceptible control. Well, those green lines are the major gene resistance family, okay? They were fine until a virulent strain of rust developed. Now, there are new susceptible controls on those sites. On the right, the same thing with mortality. Uh, it's even more dramatic. The, the major gene resistant families are, you know, about 10% higher in terms of mortality than our susceptible control. What saves the day are the quantitative resistant or partial resistant uh, families. It's not that they're immune or they don't get infected at all, but they have, you know, usable levels of resistance. Okay. This is a photo of where those graphs were taken from. And the red trees, you might say, oh, yeah, okay, Rich, those are your susceptible controls. No, the red trees that are dead are major gene resistant trees, okay? Uh, they got hammered by a virulent strain of rust because it's due to a single dominant gene. And in at least two of our species, and we think maybe now in the third species, there's virulent strains of rust that have risen. And sometimes these aren't even that widely planted. So you seem not even to need that much disease pressure to develop virulence to this major gene. Here's white bark pine, uh, another uh, white pine species. And here, um, I'd like to tell our, our former statisticians that, hey, I don't need your statistics to tell me that some of these seedling, these seedling families are planted in 10 tree row plus. So you can see very clearly that some of these seedling families of white bark pine are clearly more resistant, higher survival, than many of the other families. And uh, we think that this is a quantitative resistance, but just at a much higher level than we see in some of our other species of five needle pine. So again, this species, we got lucky. This is a map uh, and the basic thing, the pie charts here will show the proportion of seedling or parent trees in each population throughout Oregon and Washington that have low to moderate to high resistance. And the populations that have a lot of green and blue in the pie charts generally have pretty good levels of resistance. You can go back to those populations, collect them, those parent trees, plant that material. And the expectation is you probably get 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent survival. If you notice in the upper left hand corner, there's a pie there that has red, pink, and yellow. So that particular population up in the Olympic uh, uh, National Forest area really so far has very low resistance. So geographically, resistance may vary by where the population is and what you're finding. Okay, um, is resistance durable and stable? Uh, the main way of determining that is to put it out in the field, and monitor it over time, and that's essentially how durability of resistance was uh, defined. And then one thing we're investigating a little bit now is. The five needle pines are native to other parts of the world where they've co evolved with this blistera. So, do they have, do our white bark pine have the same genes or same mechanisms that exist in Russia or China or other places where the blisterus is not, uh, present? And that's maybe where some of the biotechnology and genomic tools can tell us whether we're looking at the same genes or different genes, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know. Research can be valuable, but research shouldn't drive a uh, applied resistance program. One other little tidbit here, the US Forest Service kind of has three groups. They have a research group, they have a state and private forestry group, which includes Forest Health, and then they have a national forest group. 
well, my unit is not in the research group. It's not even in the state and private group with the forest health. It's actually in the national forest group, which puts the big time emphasis on us on not getting publications out, but actually getting material out that is resistant that can be planted on the landscape. Success. This is a planting at Crater Lake National Park of some of the first parent uh, progeny of them, the first parent trees we screened from Crater Lake National Park for resistance to white pine blistera. This planting was put in in 2009. Uh, these photos are maybe a year or two old. Um, and what's neat about it, we've got six plantings up there, restoration plantings that for us, the genetic test, because every seedling is labeled. So we'll, we'll follow it. This one happens to be right at Rim Village. Crater Lake gets about 400,000 visitors every year. This is in a location where probably every single one of the visitors will see this planting, which is way cool from a public education, a conservation education point of view. Um, and then over time, it may take 20 or 25 years for the level of rust to rise high enough at this site to really fully evaluate uh, you know, the, the output that we put there, that the, the process has started. And we, we measure these almost every year. Switching to another cedar, Port Orford cedar, you may know it as Lawson cypress. It gets a uh, Phytophthora root disease. So we were asked uh, a number of years ago, back in the early 2000s, to start a resistance program. It's an interregional, interagency program. Um, and uh, we were tasked with developing orchard populations to produce seed of Port Orford cedar that have durable resistance to Phytophthora lateralis while retaining genetic diversity and adaptability. Uh, you know, and we work with national parks, we work with native tribes with our various programs. Um, so a lot of the objective of some of these groups is to value diversity, make sure we get genetic diversity out there along with the resistance and to make sure it's durable resistance. This is a graph of, okay, what's the difference between major gene resistance and partial resistance or quantitative resistance? And these lines on the left graph are major gene resistance. There's three seedling families, okay? There's 42 seedlings per family. And look at the red line at the top. 100% mortality in probably 120 days, okay? All the seedlings die. Look, this is a greenhouse test. Look at the line, yellow line at the bottom. 0% mortality even after a three year period of time. And then the green line is kind of intermediate. This is, we discerned, was um, major gene resistance. On the right, you have something different. Uh, remember, there's 42 seedlings per family. We extended the test period from one year to three years because of some noise in interpreting the data. And what we found out when we did that is some of these families. They have 42 seedlings per family, and seedlings will continue to die over different periods of time. So even within it, each of those lines is a different family, and each of the, the figures or, or uh, uh, markers there is different levels of seedling mortality along the three-year period of time. And what you'll notice is none of them, except for the pink line, eventually get up to where the susceptible goes very fast. And even the pink line, has seedlings that die at a slower rate than the susceptible. But the other one, they continue to have seedlings die, but you know, some of them only have 30 or 40% mortality even after three years. One important thing, a lot of people don't, again, um, develop a very good seedling assay or some sort of assay. The first 10 or 20 years worth of work in four different cedar, this was before I was involved came to the conclusion, it's in the literature, that there is no resistance to Phytophthora lateralis and Port Orford cedar. That turned out to be wrong, and, and the program was almost given up before it started, but then the, the researchers involved did discover right before they gave up that there was some resistance. We then turned it into an operation program and determined that there's these two types of resistance, and actually a fair amount of resistance out there. This is a species that has a lot of biological advantages. We can Put, uh, do rooted cuttings, put them in pots. Heck, we can reforest the world with the, the species if we wanted to. It's, it's, it's much easier to deal with this species than some other species. And you're going to find the same thing. You're going to have some species that are very easy biologically to deal with, other species maybe that are going to be much tougher or you have to wait a lot longer. What type of resistance? What's going to survive out in the field? This is a greenhouse test done many years ago, and they need to update it. But essentially, we're showing we divide the range into 13 breeding zones. Okay, 
Some of them are different elevation bands. Some of them are geographically different places in the range of the species. This species goes from zero meters to over 1500 meters in elevation. So we're not going to plant the same resistant material all over the range of the species. We've broken it up into, again, we want diversity, we want adaptability. And then what this shows is probably even in our first screening, we can get somewhere in the order of 50% survival in our testing uh, and in the field on, on most sites versus less than 10% survival for a woods run. This shows several groups now putting the, the material out. There were some volunteer groups that uh, are interested in fishing. They want to keep the streams cool for the fish. So they were planting some portable cedar. Uh, we recently, just this year, with one of the tribes, uh, they were interested. They want the big trees back, okay? The big portable cedar. This can get 200 feet tall or something like that, too. You know, over 60, 70 meters. And so we work with them to put in, for them as a restoration planting, but as a restoration planting combination genetic trial, I think for this species, it may end up being one of our best, it, it just started, so we'll see. It could end up being one of our best or our best genetic trial that we have out there for quite our lateralis because they did a great job on, on putting it in along with um, some of my coworkers. Here's what you'd like to see or hear, an independent group, the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. Back in 2000, they said, ah, Porter Patina is vulnerable due to the pathogen. Well, as of 2013, they downgraded that to uh, just near threatened. And they were saying with anticip anticipation that it will be listed as a species of least concern in 10 years if current conservation actions, including planting resistance dealings, are successful and maintained. So that's what you want to hear, is that you're on the road to success. Uh, biotechnology, where does it come in? Remember, tree breeding is really the key. Is biotechnology useful without tree breeding? No, it isn't. I, I, I dare somebody to convince me that it is. Uh, but it can be a very powerful tool. Uh, unfortunately for tree breeding around the world, certainly in the United States, the capacity its heyday was probably the 70s and 80s, and this paper by Nick Wheeler and some other authors kind of talk about that. So maybe we have to ramp back up a little bit and make sure we have some tree breeders and people to carry on these programs in the proper manner. Now, I'm, I'm into high tech. I don't understand it, but I would love to uh, have some high tech tools that will make our programs faster, cheaper, and whatever. A science fiction fan from way back. Some of you are familiar with the Star Trek uh, series, and they have this device called the tricorder. So my dream is, can we develop some handheld devices or some other simple measures that help us find the resistant trees faster, or at least narrow down the pool of what we have to test, find the diseases, the pathogens, the insects, et cetera, et cetera. So certainly biotechnology is a wonderful thing that hopefully we can list in the future. But a lot of times it's hyped at the beginning and, and it, it needs more research and development before it really is useful for the tree breeder. So biotechnology, a little bit of a wish list, you know, maybe it can help us define what durable resistance is and whether we have it in the species. You know, hopefully we can develop genetic biomarkers for rapid resistance evaluation. It'd be great to go out and collect needles from some of these pine trees, evaluate them and say, yep, that's going to be a good one, test it. Uh, you know, when only one out of 100 maybe that we test might be good. It can speed up breeding if you want to go to biotechnology. Maybe you can insert genes or use CRISPR uh, or like in chestnut where they may use a gene from wheat. Uh, it can also help you determine the genetic control and the mechanisms of resistance. Or, or we sometimes, we only see so many phenotypes in our white pine blister uh, program, but I wonder whether from different parts of the geographic range, are they controlled by the same genes or alleles, or are they controlled by different genes or alleles? So they certainly could help us understand why we solved the problem and, and, and how to go forward in the future. Um, certainly if you can speed up flowering for doing any breeding work, that would be wonderful. And then we also have to ask, our, what is the utility of uh, microbiota, things like endophyte, and, and working with quantitative resistance? Or, or what does, can biocontrol be helpful in some cases, too? And of course, any of these biotech tools, just like breeding, needs to be relatively inexpensive and easy to use. Porter Cedar, 
here's kind of a diagram. You know, the big tree is on the left. That's what we cherish, okay? We have a problem. We have trees dying from a root pathogen. Uh, the solution, we set up a screening assay. We set up some containerized orchards. We breed it, and then you get it back out in the field, and you're on the road to success, as long as you maintain genetic diversity and you use adapted seed sources to go with your resistance to development. I'm going to mention very quickly Sentinel Trials, a project that I and a couple of colleagues started last August. And we, what we want to know is we want to be proactive in all this. We want to know what the next invasive of pathogen or pests is of forest trees in North America um, of all of our species. And so we know there's a lot of North American species that have been planted for over 100 years worldwide. So I really want to know which of those have had a problem you know, and what problem has, and is there, you know, in some cases we have provenance trials that have been planted internationally. Are there differences in resistance that have been picked up even when there's been a problem? Recently, I read a, a, an abstract or a short paper about Don Redwood in China, and there's a new, or there's a Phytophthora species that supposedly affects that. So a light bulb goes on in my head and I say, whoa, would our native North American, our two Redwood species, would they be susceptible? So, hey, inquiring minds want to know, and I would like to know the answer to that. So, a little bit about sentinels and how they might use to predict for the future. Um, resistance breeding has a long history. This is kind of a series of conferences that were taking place from 1964 onward. There's one that's going to happen in Spain in September of 2022. So, um, we may have a, a um, online version of it as well, too. But if you can be there in person, I would certainly, it's more, we, we aim this disease to be more workshops than conferences. I love debating resistance, and I'll take any side of the equation and argue for or against, uh, depending on what people, data people present. The first two of these workshops in 1964 and 1968, that's what inspired me to start and back up in 2011 and get some funding, because I read through those, and they were more workshops than they were conferences. There were a lot of questions and answers. They even had Norman Borlaug present at, the, I believe, the first two of these workshops. And some of you or many of you know that Norman Borlaug later won the Nobel Peace Prize for the Green Revolution work that he did. He was a forester before he became a plant pathologist, before he got into, you know, uh, crops and the Green Revolution work. So, you know, uh, I was inspired by many people that came before me. I'm just showing two uh, posters real quick. You don't have to read the posters, but the key is. The key to success is partnership. I'm kind of the front person for these resistance programs, but I like to tell people like with Porter Red Cedar, there's like 14,000 trees selected. And other than one time where one of the pathologists asked me to come down to Redwood National Park and help with the selection of 30 trees, I haven't done any of those selections, okay? So there's a lot of people out there that make these programs successful. And, and that's the key is finding some people who are very passionate and are gonna push this forward. Uh, here's another one, too, showing we're sugar pine and western white pine, the same thing. It's a network of people. In this case, we work with uh, people in can groups in Canada as well as the United States. We work with tribes. I think we have four or five tribes involved in some of our white pine species work. Uh, groups in Canada, national parks, universities, grad students, U.S. Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, state agencies, counties, et cetera. It's a team effort. Um, here's a few related publications. The ones that are in the red boxes have a long list of literature cited in them. But they're, remember, my aim is to develop something and get it out in the field, okay? It's, I, I don't get any points for writing publications. I, I'll write them. But what you really cherish is to get the, you know, you really want to get the trees back out in the field and work with the people that want to get it back out in the field. So I want to thank you all for uh, your patience and for listening. Uh, this acknowledgement slide shows on the right two groups of people. And you know the bottom one is four of our technicians. And the upper one shows some of our technicians and some of our partners and different groups. But uh, you, know, you, know, you get some good people involved in this. And, and if there's a chance of, of success, you'll get there if you maintain and you push this forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. That was a fantastic presentation.
I see a few people have uh, needed to trickle off perhaps to their next meeting. So if that's you, uh, but you would like to watch the questions that we're now going to run through, rest assured that this is being recorded. Uh, so you will be able to catch up on the questions because we do have a few coming in already and I've got a few of my own. So I'm certainly going to take some time to work through them. Uh, and, and you did present some really excellent, fascinating material there. So um, perhaps a little bit of a naive question from me to start things off, but I am curious, to what extent is it valuable to start your uh, seed collecting and screening exercise by looking at what's going on in the field? Um, we, we do have an instance here with Murder Rust in New Zealand, and I'm sure that's not unusual, where you'll have a very sick tree next to a very healthy tree, right? So people would quite naturally assume, well, we should be breeding from that healthy looking tree. Um, I suspect it's not so simple uh, at all, and, and you really, if you're going to do anything at scale, need to undertake the kind of process that you're talking about. But I do wonder if what value there is, if any, in simply making your field observations to start. Excellent question and a very logical question. And early on with white pine bliss rust, the researchers in Idaho kind of took that approach. Go into an area that's heavily infected, select those trees and test them. What they found is only a, a relatively small fraction of those trees turned out to be resistant. But it was a higher fraction than if you went out there randomly. Later, Ray Hoff, and then we with another species, showed that if you go into a stand that's 90% infected, you may end up with, uh, I'm throwing a number out there and I can shoot a paper that has some of this in it. You may end up with something like 40% of the material is resistant as opposed to 10% of the material if the stand is only 40% infected, or hey, 1% of the material being resistant in a stand that doesn't have the disease yet or something like that too. So certainly it's a good starting point. I, I, I'm working with some uh, folks in uh, Hawaii and Ohia, and Ohia has several diseases, but they have one stand where the ceratocystis has killed 90% or several stands where it's killed 90% of the trees. And I say, hey, that's your starting point. You know, some pre-screening has been done. Let's now see if any of the survivors are resistant. So you're absolutely right. That's a great starting point, but it's not a guarantee until you test it. Excellent. All right. Now we we do have just a general excellent presentation and, and well done comment to start there. Uh, not so much question though. So moving on to the next one. The breakdown of major gene resistance seems like a good opportunity to understand the mechanisms in the host pathogen interaction. Has there been work into this? Yeah, you know, the, the secret that the programs that the U.S. Forest were set up in general w featured, uh, they knew that these were tree species and some smart people early on. Uh, some programs would have started a screening, found some great families that have major gene resistance stopped there and said, well, great. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, that's what happened at Jarena back in the 60s. The first families that they ever screened were from an area called the Champion Mine area, about 30 or 40 miles from where my facility is located. And a whole bunch of them ended up being resistant. So they, they thought in the 60s, well, this is going to be easy, this resistance stuff. And, but what happened is that stand on Champion Mine, the rust had gone through there, killed, I don't know, 50% of the trees. The rest of them, I'm guessing it was a neurogenetic phase, the rest of them all had major gene resistance, okay? They really didn't have anything behind the major gene resistance, so they looked really good. Long story short, those trees, parent trees in the field, started to get infected by, I don't know, maybe the 70s, and the last two, up there, I started in 91, the last two trees up there died, with major gene resistance died in 1994. So, so early on, it would have been really tempting to say, hey, we got this high resistance, we're going to use it. Um, the researchers, the key researchers were in another part of the region in Idaho, and major gene resistance has never been found there. So to a certain extent, it was not acknowledged formally that, that white pine had major gene resistance. And it was only after I started and I got up with a colleague in California that we say, hey, let's tell the true story. And there's a 1999 paper, 30, 30 years after really the discovery of this that we put out. And we, we went back to one of the, or two of the people that were there in the 60s and their co-authors on the paper. Uh, Jerry Barnes, who was really the, the person that discovered this, and then Tom Greathouse, the regional genesis at the time. But the research at the time re really didn't document it. It was really the per people working with the applied program. Uh, but, but part of the point is, is they were always screening, not just for major resistance, but we, we're looking, we inoculate seedlings and we follow them for up to five years afterwards. And we're looking for all nuances. I like to rate resistance on a zero to 100 scale. 
and, and you want to find what is your most resistant parent or your most susceptible parent tree or your most susceptible family. And then rate everything up from that. You know, that baseline is zero. And, and maybe in sugar pine, our partial resistance is maybe a five or a 10. It's not very high for Oregon or for the Oregon part of the range, but it's a starting point, okay? For Western white pine, it's probably a 10 or a 15 or maybe a 20. Uh, for white bark pine, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a 30 or 35. But rating, again, so you rate again, you know, because there's many genes probably involved in resistance. And if you throw out the stuff with low levels, you may be discarding things that are uh, quantitative and that end up being durable later. All right, so it's not the next question uh, in the list, but it's it's almost a paired question by the same person. So I will ask this one uh, next and then we'll go back. Uh, converse to breakdown of resistance, do you ever see developing resistance on formerly susceptible trees? I'll repeat that question one more time. Do you ever see developing resistance on formerly susceptible, sorry, species? Um, point there. You're not really, there, there, there is some talk in one of our white pine species that there's ontogenetic resistance, and that's been reported, but I think that's been over-reported because certainly there are some big trees that I think, hmm, for whatever reason, they won't get infected. Their progeny will be infected. Um, but there are a lot of big trees that will get infected if the situation is correct. So, so I, I think some trees do develop ontogenetic resistance. Um, you do, we do have a case that what I hate in the field trial, we will get some trees that are forked. And one of the forks will get a canker and it will kill the tree. And sometimes the other fork does not have a canker. And I have to scratch my head and say, hey, what's going on there? And we'll see if it stays canker free over time. But in some cases, it's been a number of years. So has that induced resistance? And maybe that's what the person is getting at to a certain extent. So I, I think on a small scale, that there's all sorts of things that go out there. You know, there's a lot of genetic variation out there. Every tree is different genetically, just like every human is different to a certain extent genetically. And so I, I think there are exceptions to the cases. So I think there are some cases where, hey, you might have some sort of induced resistance or some sort of onset genetic resistance or whatever too. We have not found those to be very abundant. Uh, so, yeah. All right, now the next question is, is quite a complex one, um, and I think we might just need to attack it from, from one angle. Um, or we might be here all day, but I'll, I'll read the whole thing uh, to you to kick things off. Are the ethics and need for community discussion more important in this methodology? Thinking of eco-sourcing, keeping nature as it is, also a need for change in nursery production. Uh, they're suggesting this could be the case with natives in New Zealand. Also Beth Shapiro's book, uh, Live As We Made It, and the gene edited chestnuts in the USA. So I guess the one thing that stands out there for me that um, the audience might find particularly useful to hear your thoughts on is this question around eco-sourcing, because uh, as someone who studied ecology, I'm well aware of arguments around that. Um, there are some of the scientific arguments in terms of uh, species being adapted in place and best adapted for that environment. And then there's almost more moral or ethical arguments that, you know, we shouldn't be moving things about. Um, but then of course we, we can have problems with genetic diversity or lack thereof with an eco-sourcing approach. So it would be great, I think, if you could comment on that. Yeah, again, uh, to the Forest Service credit and most of the programs in the US, even with the industry co-ops that work with uh, trees, they value diversity a lot. They value the adaptability a lot. So for all the species that we work with, we have seed zones or breeding zones, okay? And right now, we're developing populations of resistant trees within each seed zone or each breeding zone, okay? And, and, and so um, now someday in the future due to climate change, someone might say, ah, oh, should we be moving your resistant trees from slightly southern one to one slightly up elevation up north. That's a different question. But but uh, certain, right now, adaptability is a is a huge issue with us. And, and we've sub so I would encourage you if you go into one of these programs, you know, using genetic tools or common garden trials, you can discern what the patterns of genetic variation are within the species. And if you if you move resistant material too far, uh, with some species, you could have disasters due to maladaptation and, and whatever like that too. Um, you know, there's some other questions that come up with resistant material. Is there any chance that there will be a fitness cost to the resistance? 
And that's another reason there's no substitute put, putting fill trials out and let people, you know, I tend to be a skeptic about resistance. You know, we, we have these families that are resistant. I will test them again and I will put them out in the field at an array of sites and stuff like that too. So I want to, and then I want to know whether they grow well as well too. And then if you only plant out resistant material, and remember, even our best resistant families might only be 30, 40, 50, 60 percent resistant. So we have a whole rate. We're planting out seedlings, not clonal material. So every seedling out there is different genetically. So that gives us a chance for adaptation due to whatever is out there, including other competitors. So it sounds like you're saying that um, eco sourcing, in terms of at least uh, survival and ecology, there's something sound there. Um, we see the morals and the ethics is, is a whole other conversation. Um, and if you can preserve diversity, genetic diversity within that, then it's an ideal approach. But of course, we, we can't always have the ideal approach, right? You've, you've got to be able to find that diversity and survival is number one. If, if the plant's dead, then it's dead. And, and, and in the it right will, place, but dead in the right place. There's not much use to anybody. And it will vary by species. You know, part of the story with American chestnut is that there were like three or four billion of them. And, you know, some people early on claimed that there was no resistance. I think that's erroneous. There is some resistance, but it's probably very low frequency. And it's probably at a relatively low level, like our sugar pine. But there's at least one group, the American Chestnut Cooperators Foundation, that is only working with them. They have cooperators. They're plant, you know, they planted out over 100,000 of these. I haven't been to see their program yet. I would love to go there sometime. But they are working only with American chestnut. There are two other groups working with other approaches, uh, with biotechnology or, you know, uh, backcross hybridization type breeding and and whatever like that too. So each species will be a little bit different. That's why phase one is very important. What is your level of resistance? What's the geographic distribution? Uh, et cetera. Once you have those, then you can say, hey, we're stuck and we can only go this route. When I first on Porter for Cedar found the first major gene resistant family, uh, and, it, and it was a homozygous dominant, which means 100% of its progeny was resistant. You know, there was a colleague that said, hey, you're, you're done. You just cross that tree with everything else. And, you know, tree breeders and geneticists and maybe ecologists will realize, well, that might not be a good idea because that one parent tree may carry some alleles for something else that aren't necessarily good. And if that's all you have out there, let's say it was wind firmness and wind storm came and this particular parent wasn't particularly wind firm. So, yeah, you have resistance, but they're all blown over in a windstorm. So, so you know, um, I think we need to work with ecologists. We need to work with pathologists, entomologists silviculturalists, you know, the public, and, you know, having field trials out gives all those, I'm not afraid of people critiquing those files, including one at Crater Lake that 400,000 people, you know, bring it on, because if you do truly have some insights there, we want to know, and we want to know if we can make our program better and more useful to provide restoration op options. All right, and I've just got a couple more questions at the moment, so we're probably just about ready to wrap it up, and, and these ones are perhaps a little bit more straightforward. And this was one of mine as well. So thinking about climate change, how would you then direct your methods in regards to your tree and seed selection and disease screening? I mean, I'm thinking, imagining for myself, uh, climate control options in your glass houses where you can simply wind the temperature up um, and perhaps water more or less. Is that the kind of approach that you're able to take? Exactly. And we've just started on this. You know, over the years, I've now been involved in resistance breeding for, you know, since 1991 or thereabouts. And over the years, as I've read crop literature and whatever, too, I've, I've found that, well, there's a stability thing. Sometimes like a two degree temperature change will negate resistance, especially in some rust diseases. And, and so I said, should I be thinking about this? Now, here's the deal. All of the species I screen of pines come from high elevation. We screen them at a low elevation. We put a lot of spores on them, but I still want to ask, is it durable? So a couple of years ago, we started a small study with five species and we put them in four different environments after we inoculated them to ask, is there a stability potential, either major gene resistance or the quantitative resistance? That study is ending fairly soon, but I, I, think, I think our major gene resistance 
tends to, and white pine in particular, western white pine, Pinus monticula, tends to be a little bit wimpy. And I, and I think under our conditions, some years we have a lot of, uh, what do you call it, leakage or bypassing of the major gene resistance. And I suspect is, and we have starting to have some of this in the field at low elevation sites. I suspect it's due to uh, maybe this interaction with temperature. So certainly setting up some, and we've recently, we've Oregon State University started, uh, I wanted to do a test with our Fortiford Cedar and ask the same question. So they, they will be running that test up there in, in some growth chambers, et cetera. So certainly something that should be tested because, hey, nobody wants to put something out there, have it fail and say, oh yeah, it, it, Low elevation sites that are warmer, it doesn't do good on because you know the temperature negates the resistance by some way. Somebody can understand why that is, and, and there's various papers out there. But but there are ways of potentially testing it, and it would be a good thing to test. All right, and uh, probably one final one now, and from somebody whom I know is studying the microbiome, um, speculating that perhaps there's an endophyte or a microbiome assemblage in the tree, whereby one part uh, had the canker and the other did not. I think that that of course just would be a speculation at this stage, but it did make me wonder if you have worked with anybody yet who does look at microbiomes. Yeah, you know, we've we've had I've had three PhD students of the year, including Becca Ganley, do some studies at our, our facility. And there's two studies currently go two of those studies are currently going on with PhD students. And you know, I'm not endophyte specialist, microbiota specialist, but these, these students are the ones that will carry it out along with their major professors. So we are looking at that. And and I kind of wonder there's some nuances there. Um I think there is a potential role there, but it may be a little bit of a, I don't think it's gonna be an all or nothing all the time, because for instance, uh, I would even, if I were to redo some of these trials, I would say, remember we in Oxford are seen with a very heavy spore load. And I'm wondering if we can, um, if, if that might be too powerful, um, and artificial for the microbiome to protect against and, and stuff like that too. So there's a lot of questions to resolve and and for forest trees are different than crops in many respects being parental, being growing new tissue and whatever like that too. So I think there's a lot of questions to resolve. I, I hope more people do look into this, but I, I think just like the trees and asking about durability and stability, there's gonna be some key questions to ask about, about the microbiota. You know, if it hasn't co-evolved with Listerus or Phytophthoralateralis, would we expect it to be at a high level to begin with? Or would we expect it maybe to be like partial resistance, provide part of the answer, but maybe not the whole answer, et cetera. I think each species is going to be different. Each pathogen and, and test uh, situation may be different too. So you, you, you have to be careful about overgeneralizing. Okay. Very good, and I think we can wrap it up with this last comment here. Uh, great talk and discussion. Thank you. I could talk all day, but our uh, audience is, of course, slowly heading off to their next okay. engagements, and so we'll wrap it up there. Uh, but thank you so much again for your presentation. A video of today's webinar will be made available on the Beyond Myrtle Rust website in the next couple of days. It will also be emailed to everyone who registered, so whether you're, you're here live or not, you'll receive that video. Now, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, August 17th. We will hear from Rebecca Degnan, a PhD student at the University of Queensland. She is working on RNAi as a tool to combat myrtle rust, and her talk is titled Exogenous RNA Interference Inhibits Infection Physiology of Ostropaxinia obsidii to Treat Myrtle Rust in Planter. It is going to be exciting to hear about that. So look out for that invite in a couple of weeks. And because we do have uh, a few new people here today, I will just mention I am able to unsubscribe you from receiving invites to this webinar series at any time. Everybody uh, who registers does go on my list, but please do just let me know by email if you'd like to be unsubscribed. I'm aware that we have a, a wide array of webinar topics covered here. Uh, and of course, people can always catch them on the BMR website, but it's it's lovely to have my webinar invite list ever growing and to still be having a fantastic audience for this series. And I will be issuing another invite in a couple of weeks. So that's it for today, everybody. Hi, and see you next time.